roads are also an issue here with the folks who responded to the listening lab earlier in the year. So you just mentioned that you didn't think you'd need to raise taxes and considering an OLOS, but what would you do about roads and what would your priorities be with the transportation system around Bend County? Well, we, we've got a huge problem with roads, and it's no secret to anyone that the Jeffersonville Road Project Number One has been going on about 15 or 16 years. Uh, we're going to have to get on the same page and know what that project is going to cost and, and a completion date, and finish what we started. Uh, there's no doubt that we've had an influx of uh, businesses out of North Macon in the Bass Road area, and it's going to create a logistical nightmare for everyone there, let alone the hundreds of millions of dollars that are being spent there. Uh, I know the DOT has been working with the county. So we're going to have to inject some capital that we have uh, to meet our initial amount so they can put the rest of the money in from the state, from federal funds, to make those projects get sped up. But besides that, I live in Lizella, and every day I drive to work, I encounter about 20, at least 20 potholes that I have to avoid. Um, people in Lizella don't ask for much. They ask for the trash to be picked up. They ask for their roads to be in good repair because we do have to get our cars aligned a lot more often. We have to replace tires, but it's not safe when you're dodging potholes all the way throughout the community. It has to be a, fo a focus on infrastructure, and it's something we're gonna have to designate a certain amount of money each year for road improvements, and we've got to prioritize that. Uh, eventually, uh, we're gonna have to build up enough trust to have a T-SWAS, uh, whether it's four years, 10 years, whatever it may be. The counties that are making big moves in the state of Georgia have T-SWAS, and they use that to improve their roads and also improve their businesses uh, that come to that area to create more jobs. And it raises everybody up, uh, and that's something we certainly want to look at doing. But we're going to have to work on our infrastructure. We're going to have to do it little bites at a time, but we're going to have to prioritize and complete those projects that are supposed to be completed a long time ago first. What do you do to help the blight issue in Macon? Sure. Um, I've got several proposals for blight. Uh, many of you may know the, the plan I had that relates to the school is Macon Bibb County doesn't have any black money to speak of. And the way they've done it in the past has not been the best as far as dividing it up in each district. There are definitely districts who have a lot more black and have, should be a more focus. And that's part of the equity piece. And, and basically what you do uh, with my plan is folks around the school areas, we have a lot of houses that are burned out and torn, need to be torn down. The county can't do things like that unless it turns into a park for public use. What the school system can do is we can furnish children that want to maybe get a trade or a skill that could actually hook up with a contractor and we can rebuild those houses. And they would start from the ground up. They would get the permits. They would learn how to do HVAC. They would learn how to do plumbing. They would learn how to do carpentry. They can learn how to get the permits. They can start an own business. They'll get a little per diem money, a little money in their pocket. They'll get the educational purpose of be getting a skill and a job uh, to, to learn about these things. You can incorporate STEM in that. Uh, but the best part about it is we're eliminating blights we're also stabilizing that neighborhood there, and we're also, uh, you know, showing the people that go to school there that we care about your neighborhood. So Lemonade's Blight provides good skills. At the end of that time, you can sell the house for what you got in it and move on to the next project. And you can sell the house to a teacher, to a police officer, to a veteran, to a disabled person, you know, to a firefighter, and, and maintain that community in the way it should be. And would that be for high school age kids? That would be for high school age kids, uh, kids that are of age to meet that requirement and actually they're at our college and career academies or whatever trade school we may have. Uh, they're doing it through a couple of other organizations now. You can team up with uh, Habitat for Humanity, the Fuller Foundation, all these different foundations are willing to do that. But you're going to have to concentrate on area at a time instead of trying to spread everybody too thin. There's also plenty of grants. When I talked about grants earlier, there's a lot of grants that are available if you have some matching funds. A good grant writer can find ways to eliminate blights um, and we could use some matching funds to actually make some big, some big properties um, and houses and neighborhoods. The commercial blight can be concerning too, and that's something I've been focusing on, on lately. I happen to live in the west side of Bibb County where the Macon Mall is. I shop there, I eat there, I travel there. I got several businesses on that road. Um, we can't have these places just get up and leave, go to other places. We've got to have some reason to keep them there. So I talk to these business owners, and a lot of reasons they leave, and it's because of the public safety issue. If it's not the crime itself, it's the perception of crime that drives them away. And also, they, they say they don't have enough stable income in those areas and the housing necessary to justify having that business stay there. So we're gonna have to work like the Make and Bright program they have with the Industrial Authority where we can freeze those taxes for several years so we can have somebody come in and repurpose that property. And uh, we're gonna definitely repurpose some property whether we change it to medical or educational or warehouse storage. 
It's never going to be just retail anymore. Well, I think they work hand in hand. I think the um, you can't do one without the other. It just takes longer to do one than the other. Uh, the human's going to take a while to develop, so you have to start out with the education. You have to start out with the young, young portion of that. You have to start out with relationships with those communities and the faith-based organizations. Um, you know, that's the human component of it. But the immediate policy change that you can have to change the policies, maybe change uh, a few things that maybe the zoning, you know, the zoning board and how things are done there, uh, just revise some of the policies they've had to make it more efficient and easier to work with. And that way everybody has a clear understanding of how we're supposed to do business and make sure that we do it that way. So I don't think you can separate the human component as far as the elimination of light. I think it's, they're both part and parcel. Just some take a lot more, it's like a relationship takes a lot more time uh, to develop over a period of time to get married. But you can go out on a date tonight. So you, you have some instant you know, gratification there, but you also have the human component where it takes a while and to build up trust. And that's something I look forward to doing as well. We have all kinds of areas where not only we have residential blight, but it seems like commercial blight is popping up. Eisenhower Improvement District, um, over Presidential Parkway, all of these big box stores that have vacated, even the Publix on Tom Hill Senior Boulevard and the old Kmart. I mean, what could you do or, or what is your strategy in terms of bringing the community back and doing away or, or fixing the solution of having all these empty spaces? Um, you know, Part of, that's two questions there. First, let me deal with residential blight. Residential blight is the byproduct of the economic disparities in these various communities. When you don't have opportunities, when, you're, when we don't see uh, uh, investment going in particular areas, blight is a byproduct of lack of those type of investment and the economic disparities that exist in these various communities is a direct correlation between blighted neighborhoods and economic disparities. So the first thing we got to do is address that need to be able to provide economic opportunities for people in the various communities that we say uh, we have an issue with, with blight. That's our residential blight uh, issue. I take pride in the fact that I work directly with the city of Macon and uh, address blighted properties. In fact, uh, we've won two national awards for addressing blight and substandard housing, two national awards for that work. We know how to do this. But you can't begin to address blighted communities without addressing the economic development component that causes blight. Residential blight is different than commercial blight. Commercial blight has the same underlying uh, issue. Why are there economic blights? Some would tell you that it's crime. I don't believe that. Crime is not the byproduct of why you have commercial blight. You have commercial blight because you have a lack of resources in the community that can support a Macon Mall versus the Rivergate Mall. If the, if the revenues was there, commercial, the commercial industry will find a way to deal with whatever the issues are and mitigate them. We're talking about the economic development situation in a community. It's not a, it's not a magical thing that we have dollar generals and family dollars popping up all across this community. That's not an accident. What we've got to do is drill down and turn the tide with supporting entrepreneurs and people in this community that need opportunity and spread the resources that exist it's not an accident that downtown showed such great improvement. A significant amount of resources, public resources, went into the development of downtown. What a Whitby administration would do is devote those kind of resources in those communities, in those areas. The commercial component is much different. We got to have a much better economic situation in making for those to come back but we start where we are and we have a plan to get to where we want to go how important is it to have a 
to improve roads and traffic in Macon Bibb County? That was one of the top or one of the concerns that we found in the listening lab that we had earlier this year. You know, the roads, um, I, first let me say, I am so pleased to have the largest um, uh, DOT project in the state with the 1675 uh, uh, construction work that's taking place. Uh, that was long overdue. A lot of issues resulted in why it took the time it took to get that project let um, uh, uh, here locally, but it finally happened. We had the same situation with Forest Hill Road. This is, again, in my opinion, the Jeffersonville uh, Road project out there. We have a history of allowing partisan politics to creep in to things that have to be done and need to be done. I think I am the candidate that can work across party lines, across racial lines, to really come up with what's good for making, what's good for business, is good for making and we put petty differences aside, come out of the silos and work together as one community. And if we do that, we can see an improvement in not just roads. We can put fights aside because it's in the best interest for the overall community. So fixing roads is a lot easier than fixing blighted neighborhoods. We can fix roads. We, we can fix our blighted communities, but it starts with us coming together and recognizing we're in this city together and if we're gonna make it what we want it to be, we got to work together.